Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hello, everyone. And we are being joined by a very special honey bunny. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone, please welcome back Evie. Hi, hi. (laughs) So, Evie, when did we have you on for last? St. Elmo's Fire? I think so. I think so, yeah. Have you had any other adventures into the filmography of Joel Schumacher since then? I have not. I did watch The Big Sick on the airplane, but that has nothing to do with Joel Schumacher. No. And everything to do with me crying (laughs) on an airplane and people around me being like, is she okay? (laughs) Are there things wrong with her? And I'm like, I mean, obviously, but not today. (laughs) We are here for the 1992 primetime soap opera 2000 Malibu Road, which Joel Schumacher not only co-produced with Aaron Spelling, but he directed all six episodes, which aired. Had either of you ever heard of 2000 Malibu Road before? No. I had not. I think I was too young. Well, here's a question. Did either of you watch Beverly Hills 90210 and or Melrose Place? No. I watched some of 90210. I think I was ancillarily aware of 90210 and just wanted to be in high school when I was a child. (laughs) But otherwise, no, like I never actually watched it. This series was produced by Aaron Spelling, one of the major figures of American broadcast television. I just started as an actor back in the 50s. He was guesting on episodes of I Love Lucy back in the day and then started producing. And he did shows like Mod Squad, Charlie's Angels, Fantasy Island, The Love Boat, Dynasty. And again, in 1990, Beverly Hills 90210 debuted, which was a huge hit and was followed in 1982, the very same year that this series, 2000 Malibu Road, debuted with Melrose Place. Mm -hmm. And later on, Aaron Spelling would then go on to do Seventh Heaven and Charmed. Again, he had a very, very long legacy in television. I mean, a lot of it was kind of disposable entertainment, but it was very popular shows. And the series was created by Terry Louise Fisher, who at least wrote the pilot. I don't know if she wrote all the episodes because I haven't really looked into those yet. But it was written by Terry Louise Fisher, who started out as a lawyer and in the 70s published two novels, two legal dramas, which led her to actually become one of the prominent writers on Cagney and Lacey. Hmm. And then in 1986, she was the co-creator with Stephen Bochco of L.A. Law. Unfortunately, they only worked together on that show for two years before then a contract dispute thing where he tried to oust her. She tried to oust him. He ultimately won because he's Stephen Bochco. And she was literally escorted from the set. Damn. Yeah, I'm sure there's more story behind it, but she struggled to get things back on the air. She had this series come up in 92. She had a couple of other pilots that aired, but nothing that really caught on. And by the mid 90s, she doesn't have any other credits. It looks like she just largely retired. And of course, this episode and all six episodes of the show are going to be directed by Joel Schumacher. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And otherwise, I don't really have any other production details. Angie, I'll let you take it away. All right. Jade is a prostitute who wants to get out of the business. Unfortunately, she doesn't have much money at the moment, and the market is so poor she can't sell her giant Malibu home. The realtor suggests she takes on a few roommates to help make some cash in the meantime. She ends up taking on three. There's Perry, a defense attorney, who decides to move back to Malibu after the death of someone close to her and immediately runs into her high school crush. He tells her he's gotten into some trouble with a fatal attractions type scenario and the woman is currently bringing charges against him. Perry immediately offers to defend him, though she is momentarily shaken when they run into the woman in a restaurant and she shouts to the world that the guy is a rapist. The other two roommates are sisters Lindsay and Joy. Lindsay is an aspiring actress and Joy is her agent, and they decide to come to Malibu based on Joy's psychic feeling that it will improve Lindsay's career. She's right, Lindsay is immediately offered a small part in a film while wandering the beach, but when the people behind the film suggest Lindsay get a real agent, Joy can't handle that. She goes behind Lindsay's back and tells the people that Lindsay can't possibly go to Vancouver to film because she's crazy and it will trigger a mental breakdown. And would they mind making up an excuse to help preventing upsetting Lindsay about her mental condition? They do so and Lindsay is heartbroken. 
Joy is also a bit of a snoop entering Jade's bedroom, even though Jade specifically told her roommates to leave her stuff alone. She answers Jade's work phone, and after a misleading conversation with a regular client, he shows up at the house and makes a move on Lindsay before being chased away. Jade is also in some kind of trouble, being stalked by people who are trying to kill her and rubbish through her room for unknown reasons. A woman who originally was trying to ransack her place ends up dead on the beach, and Jade is scared, not sure what to do. As the episode ends, Amanda is watching her sleep in her bedroom and tells someone on the phone that she's alone and he can do whatever they need. He loads his gun as the scene fades to black. So Angie, do you recommend this pilot and would it have made you want to watch the rest of the series? No. What I didn't get to mention before, I didn't see 90210 or Melrose Place because I had zero interest in (laughs) watching them. Partially, I was a little young, but of course, a lot of other girls my age had no problem with it. They were all obsessed with Luke Perry and Jason Priestley and all that. But I'm just not a soap opera fan in general, especially of this caliber. As a pilot, I mean, they're setting up angles, but it's all over the place. Like, they kind of hit the ground running, which I guess is good. But I don't know. These people are not people I really want to know anything more about. Let's put it that way. Evie, how about you? No! <laughs> Oh my god, it's like the pilot is like, and then this, and then this, and then this, and I'm like, can we just one plot? I get that you're trying to introduce all these characters and set up everything, but what the hell? Like, slow down for five seconds, let me breathe. And honestly, I think the problem is, this is how pilot would go, is just set up a bunch of stuff and characters, and then you'll figure it out later. But just emphatically, no. (laughs) Yeah, I don't either. I'm kind of struggling to see what Joel's bringing to this. Yeah. To be fair, what we're watching are very low quality video files. So it's like we can't really totally judge the cinematography and the lighting and all that <laughs> stuff. I mean, he brings very classy production design. It's cleanly put together. But it's typical trash soap opera writing. Mm-hmm. I don't care about the characters. It's hammering way too hard at all the conflicts that we pretty much can see coming. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask, hey, what do you think is going to happen in the next few episodes? I'm pretty sure we're <laughs> going to be on the money. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's very heavy-handed. It's a modestly interesting cast. It's kind of interesting seeing what were big-name movie stars at the time Mm -hmm. kind of trying TV for the first time. But it's just not interesting. It's not that engaging. It's not a terrible setup for a show. No, it's not. So what did y'all think about that opening credits? (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing. I I will say, like, if the rest of the show had been as cheesetastic as those opening (laughs) credits, this would have been, like, an instant recommend. Right? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, God, that was amazing. That's the most Joel aspect of the show right there. Mm. (laughs) Especially when Michael T. Weiss peels off the swimsuit. (laughs) Ladies. (laughs) So, yeah, for our listeners who haven't seen it, check the show notes. I'll put it in there. But it's like this slow pan as, like, each of our characters is in this semi-representative tableau. (laughs) we repeat the shots three times each one going from a wide shot to a medium shot to a close-up closer 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 (laughs) as they literally repeat the movement but there's little differences michael t weiss of course going from being fully clothed to no clothed (laughs) and it's all set to gloriously terrible synth saxophone music Yep. (laughs) It was amazing. What's funny is it keeps going on. Mm. It introduces this character and now another character. I think it goes on for like eight or nine characters. It is a lot. I want a parody version that like a Too Many Cooks. It just keeps going on for like 20 minutes. Just bring in these weird tableaus. You know, here's extra in background Mm -hmm. shot number two. (laughs) Oh God, yes. I want that. I think the best thing of this entire episode was the opening credits and it's terrible in a good way. Right, right. Yeah. It has like the porno sex is what I was calling it in my oh, head. Oh, yes, that yes. too. Right. It's the early 90s porno sex. Yeah. The whole episode had a lot of that, really. Yeah. I noticed that the theme was done by was it James Newton Howard, mm. who did the St. Elmo's Fire theme. Oh. <laughs> Why don't we just kind of talk about the premise? It is an interesting premise where, you know, it's high class escort who's run into trouble. She's trying to get out of the business. You know, former clients are hounding her. She's got Mm. these other people who are watching her. She needs money. So she decides to rent out some rooms and all these other people get caught up in her drama while they bring their drama to her. Angie, what do you think about that just as kind of a basic premise for a show? I guess I was expecting, and like I said, this is someone who's never actually watched Melrose Place, but I feel like Melrose Place was like, here's a bunch of people living in the same area. Let's see how they interact. Whereas this, at least, they had some interesting reasons. Like, you have no idea what's going on with Jade there. Perry is obviously bringing a little bit of courtroom drama to the whole thing. 
I like that they were at least like a wide variety of characters who were all interacting with each other mm -hmm. and not just like pretty people living in a house. As a premise for a show, I mean, I might not be like, oh, yeah, no, I'm going to watch that every week. But at least it sounds interesting. There's interesting places you can go with it. Mm -hmm. But it's also like rich people problems. Yeah. It's one where you yeah. can see what the pitch was. And you can see why people were intrigued by the pitch. Mm -hmm. God, where to start? Uh <laughs> <laughs> it's a rich tapestry and we've only watched one episode. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and just start with Lisa Hartman as Jade. So, Evie, what did you think about Jade? Her hair was amazing. <laughs> It's a Joel Schumacher film. Everyone's hair is amazing. Sure. I know, but it was. It was like stunning. Even his hair was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something like nice at least. I'm like, <laughs> she had a nice house. I don't think she's really a character. I think she's like a person that stuff happens around. Like I haven't seen her as a character yet. So I have to withhold opinion until I see her as a fully fleshed out character. Yeah. I mean, her characterization at this point is like, y'all are going to live here because I need money, but leave me alone. Like... <laughs> That's pretty much all that we really... Until I get a headache, then I'll tell you everything. <laughs> right. Like, I'll say this. I want to know what the heck is going on with all of these people watching her. Just because you keep hinting at it, they seem almost like they're the police, but then they also seem like they're the mob. What are they? Just tell me already. But there just isn't that much to the character yet to really like or dislike her. Yeah, there's still a lot of mystery. Again, they're very clumsy. And again, that she's mm -hmm. so, I don't want to say standoffish, but she's so definitely wanting to build a wall between herself yeah. and these tenants. And then even by the end of the pilot episode, she is opening up and telling someone, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is why I became a prostitute. Yeah, 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 don't worry about that. Oh, yeah, this is one of my clients, by the way, just so you know all this confidential information. Yeah. That's bad writing. That's really bad mm -hmm. writing. And that's something that everyone basically figures out that she's a pro, or at least one of the main characters figures out that she's a prostitute. Even before the first episode is done, it's like, well, <laughs> then where's the drama to build up on her trying to hide that lifestyle from these people? Right. I don't think Lisa Hartman gives a bad performance. It is perfectly fine performance. But yeah, I think they're trying to set up mysteries while also trying to captivate you with the mysteries to the point where they're kind of giving away the mysteries. You know, you set up the one client who almost kills her in the beginning, and then you have these other people who rough her up later on. Again, within the first episode, they reveal that those two are connected mm -hmm. instead of letting that play out a little more and build up. Yeah, I could see the interesting idea here, mm -hmm. but it's not being executed very well. No. Though I will say I adore the guy at the beginning who tries to murder her and then is just like, honey, I'm sorry. I got upset. I was just playing. I thought we were having fun. <laughs> mm -mm. So Evie, what'd you think about Jennifer Beals as Perry Quinn, the lawyer? Her hair was not as good. <laughs> <laughs> My entire opinion is going to be about hair. That's it. That's what I've decided. <laughs> I like Jennifer Beale, so I liked her character. I think out of all the characters, hers was the one where I'm more interested to see what else we're going to get in with her. I think kind of similar to Jade, we're just not seeing a whole lot yet that I have a hard time really having an opinion on her. Like, clearly there's something interesting going on with that backstory. And I mean, as far as this guy, I mean, obviously she's living out her high school dreams here mm -hmm. and kind of blinded to the whole situation. But I mean, she was okay. She was not entirely wooden at times, but there's not a whole lot for her to do yet. I think Jeffrey Beals is perfectly fine. Again, I think she's not bad for being one of your lead protagonists. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting, you know, it's the young lawyer who is obviously very skilled at what she can do, but she's kind of disillusioned by the type of clients that she's had to defend. I'm pretty sure her fiance is the person who died and she's still trying to get over that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see how it's like, you know, that big life trauma. It's still pretty recent. She just wants to step away and reevaluate. And yet every single situation she runs into, it's like, hey, I'm a lawyer. Do you need a lawyer? <laughs> right. Hey, I'm a lawyer. Can I take a look at that for you? Hey, I'm a lawyer. Let's go. Hey, you free? Let's go talk to the DA. You know? Like you said, bad writing. It's like that's the only thing they know how to characterize her as right now. By the way, the creator of the show. Hey, did you know I'm a lawyer? <laughs> I write about lawyers. I wrote LA Law. Yep. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's interesting. I'm not really getting that much drama from the backstory. It's like, okay, her fiance died. Right. Unless there's more of a story to that. I don't know. Maybe it's like one of the clients that she defended killed her fiance. Who knows? Maybe there's some backstory there. 
honestly, she would be a great setup for a small town drama of like a big city lawyer loses her love, tries to reevaluate. She moves to a small town and gets caught up in all the small town antics and shenanigans and brings her legal knowledge in to actually help small towns. Like I could see like a Northern Exposure type of series. Mm -hmm. Want that show, Noel? Yeah. (laughs) Damn it. Why can't I have the things I want? I could see this character in that type of show, but I'm sure David E. Kelly's already made three of that show. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that explains why I didn't watch it then. That's why. Hey, I will always support the man who wrote Lake Placid. <laughs> okay, fair. Very fair. Where's the juicy drama of this character yeah. if you're going to do like a primetime trashy soap opera? Tied into her story, I did want to just give props. Hey, we get to see Kimberly Scott again from Flatliners mm. as her friend in the beginning. Yeah. Who's, hey, we have a black person on who's literally just in one scene as the lead character's friend who literally says girl. Yeah. <laughs> It's a nice scene. She's a nice performer. I, I always like seeing her as an actress, but yeah, it's just kind of a right. token early 90s black friend scene. But she conveniently moves away from, so we'll never see again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what do you think about Michael T. Weiss as Roger Tabor, the restaurant manager who she used to go to high school with and is reconnecting with? I'm going to go ahead and take a stab here and say he's a rapist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <gasps> what? <laughs> no. I think he does a good job doing the charming, but there's probably something not good going on underneath all of that, that kind of character. He's doing it well, but that's pretty much all of he is, yeah. Oh, he's 100% a rapist. And so he was just like, yeah, this woman accused me of rape. I'm like, because you raped her. This is why. That entire conversation was so painful to listen to. Mm-hmm. Uh, As the story was first happening, I'm just kind of like, they're doing an interesting spin where he's the accuser who now has to defend against it. And it's like, as soon as Hope Davis shows up, by the way, Hope <laughs> Davis, again, this is like her third Joel Schumacher thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, he did do it. Yep. 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 Yeah. So I think, yeah, we see where that's going to go. And then that would probably come into play as the relationship continued to develop between him and Jennifer Beals. Yep. Yep. Given how fast this show goes, that'll probably be in the first 10 minutes of episode two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe episode three. <laughs> they got to have sex first. <laughs> Given how much he's noted for being a pretender, Michael T. Weiss is not pulling off surfer dude. <laughs> no. It's like he's trying. He's got the bleach blonde yeah. hair. We saw him in the opening credits. He's trying to even put in a little bit of that voice, you know? <laughs> it's not working. No. So, Evie, what did you think about Lindsay and Joy, played by Drew Barrymore on Tuesday night, the actor-manager team of sisters? I'm so confused by them. (laughs) I think I'm more confused by the manager sister, who's also a little psychic. I'm just like, you're a terrible manager. And person. And person, Mm -hmm. but mostly, first and foremost, you don't even do your own job. Mm -hmm. And that family was right in telling your sister to get someone professional, because you're not, because you suck. And Drew Barrymore is, I don't know, maybe she's just playing my idea of what Drew Barrymore was at the time. So I'm just like, she's fine. I don't really know anything about her except that she's adorable. And Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Trying to remember when this would have been in relation to Bad Girls, because I know this was right before Scream and she did her comeback. I was thinking it's at least pre-comeback, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Probably while she's on TV. (laughs) When was Never Been Kissed? I've never seen Never Been Kissed. I think like 99. Yeah, that was later. That was a really cute movie. Oh, super cute. I adore Drew Barrymore. I think she's absolutely adorable. Once again, she doesn't have a whole lot to do other than play like innocent, sweet actress who should really have figured out by now in her life that her sister is clearly evil. And that's the thing with Joyce. And yeah, I get it, trashy soap opera, but she's so obviously evil that it's ridiculous. You know, she's screwing up her sister's life. She's meddling in with Jade's stuff. And then she's talking to the guy and trying to sort of book a job with him, but then not, and then almost gets her sister raped in the process. Wow, like we are coming straight out the gate with her on this. And then the weird thing with the feathers and the whatever she was trying to do, I don't even know. Yeah, she is way too over the top. Yeah, Joy is... (laughs) I've never been the biggest fan of Tuesday Night as an actress, but I don't think she's the problem with this part. No. The problem is, yeah, it's just way too cranked up to 11 to Mm -hmm. the point where it's like, how is anybody trusting her when she says, oh, honey bunny, you can trust me? (laughs) No, that's like red flag. No, I don't trust you with that. (laughs) And yeah, the psychic visions, the cleansings, the incense, the feathers straight up sabotaging her sister's career Mm -hmm. behind her sister's back, turning her away from a potential sweet love interest. 
And yeah, everything that she's starting to sink in with joy. It's like, don't go into my room. Don't use my phone. She goes into her room and uses her phone, sets up Mm -hmm. a client who literally comes and almost rapes her sister. And it's just, oh. And by the way, prediction, because that guy's a TV network executive, she's probably going to push her sister to sleep with him. Probably. Yeah. And here's the thing. Given how over the top her performance is, Tuesday night is literally wearing a fat suit. Is that it? Okay. She actually doesn't look that different from Drew Barrymore in real life. You're right. Are they literally going to just have a scene where she reveals that she's been wearing a fat suit this whole time? Oh, oh okay. God. I, I, yeah. I, you know what? This show, I could see them doing that. Where Drew Barrymore finally gets offered her dream role and it ends up going to this other actress who's really her sister who strips off the fat suit. <sighs> I could see that happening. Mm. Mm-hmm. And also I could see her like literally summoning a demon. <laughs> Probably. (laughs) Let's remember after this, Aaron Spelling did go on to do Charmed. Mm -hmm. I never watched Charmed. (laughs) I would actually probably become more interested in the show if she actually summoned a demon. (laughs) You add some more uh, mystical, like, full on, right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Why not? (laughs) And then, like, Drew Barrymore becomes the Slayer before the Slayer. Like, this would have been the same year (laughs) the Buffy the Vampire Slayer came out as a movie. Mm -hmm. This is how the Hellmouth opened. The Hellmouth is on 2000 Malibu Road. <laughs> you know what? That would make so much sense. Yeah. Because it was either going to be California or Jersey that the Hellmouth was going to be in anyway. Right. You know, and it's six episodes, 666, huh? Huh? <gasps> <laughs> I, yeah, I think Drew Barrymore, it's a very naturalistic performance. Yeah. I don't think it's bad. Again, I do think she actually does a decent job with the anxieties of being a struggling actress. And mm-hmm. when she finds out that people are lying to her, you know, her reaction is very genuine. But yeah, Tuesday Night's character is the absolute fucker of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Like, she is the one who will just fuck shit up just for the sake of fucking shit up and then blame it on other people in order to further fuck things up. I am mm-hmm. always so infuriated by characters like that, unless you pull it off in just the right way, and this is not just the right No. No. Not even remotely close. So, Evie, though, what did you think about Brian Bloom as Eric, the young aspiring filmmaker with the producer parents who catches Drew Barrymore's eye? He was such a nothing burger that I was like, who? Oh? I still have no opinion on him because he's just like nothing to me. Yeah, I'm like, he was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And someone was like, what about him? I'm like, you know. he was there. His hair is not that good at all. He needs better hair. <laughs> but yes. Can you believe that around this same time, they did a series of four Smokey and the Bandit TV movies where they cast this guy as the bandit? <laughs> <laughs> what? But yeah, Brian Bloom, he's actually a character actor I've enjoyed over the years, but during the opening credits, we even get a shot of him like in a smoky room, like lifting up a film camera towards the audience. And it's oh, like, yeah. oh, they're setting up some mystery and some intrigue. And now he's just this kind of normal, happy-go-lucky kid on a beach. He wants to make some movies. Yeah. I'm like, are we going to like have this big twist where it's like he's been working in porn? <laughs> That would be interesting by comparison. It's the seedier yeah. underside, you know? It's like, yeah, his parents produce these low-budget independent films. How do you think they finance them? <laughs> Porn. Yeah, at this point, he's a part of the cast. Like, he seems like he should just be there for the one episode, and then <laughs> Lindsay moves on. So, yeah, I don't yeah. know what they're going to do. And it's like half of his screen time is playing with the dog. <laughs> oh, that dog is adorable. I love that dog. Yeah. He's a good dog. <laughs> <laughs> And then in the opening credits, I did notice that there was one person who we didn't see here. There's the pensive biker. Yeah. Who was that? I guess we'll find out. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be curious to see who is pensive biker. Yeah. Or I should say, quote unquote, curious. <laughs> we still have to record an episode on it. Right. Okay, cut to the next episode. I don't care about the biker. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was so disappointing. I don't care. Any thoughts on the mysterious people in the van? So confused. Right. Just tell me who they are at this point, yeah. please. Well, because technically it's just person now because yeah, the woman's dead. They killed Tasha Yar. Right. I wanted more of Tasha Yar. Was that Tasha Yar? No, but she had the same haircut. Okay, she did. No, I mean, just this video quality was so bad. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what I thought, too. I was just like, Denise? She was a really cool character. Yeah, she looked like Tasha Yar in a leather Mm -hmm. jacket, and she was a really cool character, had a nice screen presence. I wanted Mm -hmm. to know more about her, so of course they killed her off halfway through the first episode. Mm -hmm. Of course. And instead we just get creepy, chewy guy. That guy, oh my god, he chews. Yeah, stop the chewing. That is like some emphatic chewing, too. And it's not even scenery chewing. It's like he's literally just sitting there chewing. Yeah, like chewing gum or whatever he's doing, but it's so gross. He's going deep with that chew. Ugh. Tobacco, maybe? I don't know. Ugh. Peanuts? <laughs> I thought it was might be peanuts. This is the show now. We're just trying to figure out what that guy's chewing. 
<laughs> oh, crunchy peanut butter. Could have been crunchy peanut butter. <laughs> Wheel of chewables. Turn, turn, turn. Tell us the chewable that he has chewed. Something that makes you salivate a lot. We know that much. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. I had a bit on the episode I sent you guys where I was actually trying to clean up the audio a little bit. I got some juicies. Mm. I was not successful. The audio is really bad. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's not your fault. <laughs> yeah, it's like all that's available of this show is what's on YouTube. There's even still a few promotional bumpers, but it looks like it was yeah. just taped off of when it originally aired. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I was just like, Star Search. I was like, go on. Yeah, right. Yeah, Star Search is premiering. Oh, yeah. okay. Can we watch that? <laughs> yeah, that's my thought. I was like, can we watch into that one? And then every episode has the Jennifer Beals fan club website right. in the corner, because I think that's where these were originally hosted. Mm -hmm. It's who only thought to care to keep it. <laughs> well, I think that wraps up our discussion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is there much else? I don't no. know. So one thing that was funny was I did actually read the script for the pilot. What's weird about the script is two things. One, it was written to be a half hour show initially. Hmm. Huh. With this much? Yeah, no, it's like literally when, when she has her big speech about how her parents died and then goes and answers the phone and says, hi, mom. That was the mm. end of the pilot episode. Okay. That's why there was probably so much rushed in the first half of the mm -hmm. episode because they were planning for a much shorter format initially. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the episode was, I don't know what stage I was grafted on, but also this script was very descriptive of sex and nudity, had sweat. Wearing, so I'm wondering if it was meant for a cable network originally. Okay. Like a Showtime or a Cinemax, Cinemax or something. Cinemax or something, like yeah. Because mm -hmm. this would have been the era of like Red Shoe Diaries and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And by the way, Angie, mm -hmm. remember how when we did Slow Burn, I was like, hey, do you think if Joel Schumacher had directed this, it would have been any better? Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically slow burn <laughs> yeah 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 pretty slow much burn the tv series mm -hmm. and i was hoping for like saint Elmo's fire of the tv series but it's not as interesting no. mm -mm. i'm not really feeling joel at the handle in terms of story and characters and stuff and there's a right. few changes in the script but very minor otherwise pretty much whatever she wrote is here and Terry Louise Fisher mm. is not a very good writer. The actual descriptive text was bizarrely fourth wall breaking and gets into these weird sidetracks. And <laughs> it was a strange, strange script. Hmm. So Evie. Yes. Other than what we've discussed, do you have any other predictions for what might happen in the remainder of the show? It's going to be terrible. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. Okay, and what are the specific story aspects that are going to further fuel this terribleness? I mean, someone's going to have an evil twin. <laughs> I'm going with that one. Well, someone already has an evil sister. No. Maybe she is really an evil twin. Ah, Maybe that's the secret. She's been hiding the fact that she's a twin. <laughs> oh, I want it to be that you find out the evil sister is evil. Like Drew Barrymore's character finds out her evil sister is evil. And then her evil sister turns out that she has powers and she wipes her memory. Ooh, or, or, or mm. she freaky Fridays her. Yes, that too. Mm. She steals her body. Yeah. I remember that episode of Buffy. <laughs> yeah, Lindsay's going to try to get away and Joy's going to do something magic inspired to her, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So any other predictions on your end, Angie? No, I don't know. I guess I don't watch enough trashy stuff, but I'm sure it'll be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm guessing Jennifer Beals is going to turn out, yeah, her fiance died. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if it was by someone that she defended who might come after her. I definitely think even if they don't reveal that Michael T. Weiss's character is a rapist, I think they'll at least raise that question and that possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that'll create conflict. And of course, it'll happen after she's already consummated her relationship with him. Right. I bet you at some point they wouldn't get an actress on the caliber of Hope Davis to play that character if they weren't planning to have some actual scenes where they sit down with that character and explore her side more. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm thinking it's going to build up to, remember how the DA was like, yeah, you'll tear her apart on the bench, it'll be over. Right. I'm betting that scene on the bench is probably going to happen. That's probably going to be a hell of a, not a hell of a scene, but it's going to be meant to be a hell of a scene. <laughs> Again, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some seedier underside to the filmmaker and the relationship with Drew Barrymore will continue to go down that area. Again, conflict with the sister. The sister will probably mm. be evil and blow everyone up. I wouldn't be surprised if the reason why people are after Jade is it's a political situation and that's the guy's security team. Because hmm. I don't know if they're feds trying to bust her because they're trying to kill her. They're trying to silence her. So I'm thinking it might just be because she has some tie that they don't want getting out. 
Mm -hmm. Who is the guy in the first scene? He was trying to kill her, right? Yeah, well, again, remember that was also she said, I'm quitting, I'm never going to see you again. Right. So you think he was unrelated? Well, we know he's a part of it because he knocked on the van, remember? That's right. That's Mm -hmm. right. I think he's tied to them. I wouldn't be surprised if he's someone who has political ambitions. Okay. This is his security force trying to find out what she knows and keep her from telling anyone about it. Hmm. That's my thought. Okay. I think the house is going to continue to look lovely. Sure. I think the dog will continue to be happy. (laughs) I love that the dad of the filmmaker is Adrian Monk's psychiatrist. (laughs) It's pretty by the numbers so far for stuff. (laughs) I should mention I did watch One Life to Live for a couple years. I've watched a couple of primetime soaps in my time. I watched Dark Shadows before they brought in the vampires when it was all just soapy. (laughs) I still haven't even gotten up to Barnabas yet. (laughs) I watched some of Passions. Granted, Passions was even sillier than this, which made it even better. (laughs) Otherwise, yeah, it's not very good. No. So just some info on when it aired. It aired on CBS on August 23rd, 1992. And what's interesting is CBS is not the network that Beverly Hills 90210 or Melrose Place were on. Those were on Fox. Right. So Aaron Spelling was running these successful shows for one network and was like, hey, here's a similar show for a competing network. (laughs) So I'm sure that stirred up some trouble. Now, the thing is, this was actually a rating success. Hmm. August 23rd, 1992 was a Sunday night. These first two episodes, this and the one we'll be covering next, aired Hmm. on the same night in a two-hour block. And it was on a Sunday night, primetime, 9 o'clock, and all that it was up against were reruns of Married with Children and Herman's Head on Fox. On NBC, they were playing Tremors. (laughs) And on ABC, they were playing the ABC Sunday night TV movie, The Perfect Tribute. Okay. Which was about a young boy looking for his brother who is a soldier in the Civil War and ends up encountering Abraham Lincoln delivering the Gettysburg Address. (laughs) Okay. So not Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. No. No. Disappointed. You never know that might be off the page. (laughs) There might be implications. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that it's Abraham Lincoln means he has to be doing some vampire hunting at some point. That's true. Even if we don't see it, we know that's history. That's canon. (laughs) <laughs> so, yeah, that's literally all it was up against, and it pulled in 16.1 million viewers. Hmm. That's pretty good ratings for a debut, even though it's on a Sunday night and there's literally nothing else on. Right, nothing else on, yeah. I do have more data on the subsequent episodes. We'll bring that up when we get into those. There's still some mystery as to why this series ended up getting canceled. I can see the appeal. It's like, again, creator of L.A. Law. It's an interesting enough pitch. You got some star power in terms of you're bringing in Drew Barrymore and Jennifer Beals, who had some big success in movies, trying out their foot in television for the first time. You got Joel Schumacher sign on to direct all six episodes. And one thing that I found out is that this wasn't a thing where it's like there were 13 episodes and only six aired. No, this was only meant to be six episodes with the potential to then continue on beyond that. But it's interesting Mm -hmm. how they structured it in a shorter block with a single director, similar more to how we're doing a lot of the streaming shows these days. Right. You know, a lot of streaming Mm -hmm. shows will be like eight or 10 episodes. They'll have at least one or two directors doing that whole block. It's interesting that beyond the pilot, they kind of did this as like a solid package like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not too common for back then, I don't think. And I actually saw interviews with Tuesday Night and Jennifer Beals where they bring up that the biggest selling point on this show was Joel Schumacher. Hmm. Because again, this was Joel coming right off of Flatliners and Lost Boys. St. Elmo's Fire had become the cult hit that it is now. Okay. So there were a lot of actors who wanted to work on it. And I actually found out Jennifer Beals was actually in talks to play one of the roles in St. Elmo's Fire, but she was taking a break from acting at the time because she was in the middle of getting a couple of college degrees. Was it Joel's? Or did they say which one she was up for? I don't know. I didn't see which character. I'd be curious Mm. to. I wouldn't be surprised if it was Jules. You know, I could maybe see her in the Ali Sheedy role, just not as Ali Sheedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know. I could see her in the Rob Lowe role. (laughs) Cool. I could see her playing all the characters, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's the whole movie is just her playing all the characters. Say No Most Fire, where everyone is played by Jennifer (laughs) Beals. That would be an awesome (laughs) one. Yeah, otherwise, I don't really have anything else to add on the pilot. Anything else either you two have? No. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just, like, not terribly excited to watch the rest. That's For five more hours of this. Yeah. I'm wondering if maybe there's a chance that it improves, because I know that the way that they used to do pilot episodes of things is different than the way we do it now. Well, sometimes the creative teams will change hands, but this one, we know it's still Joel. 
Well, they could get their footing, right? But I meant like the way that they used to structure pilots is different than the way we do it now. Like, okay, we're dropping you in a story and we're introducing you to things as we go along. We're not just like, and we have to set up this character and this character and this character. You have to sell the whole concept in one episode. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Whereas the way that they used to make pilots is, I think, closer to maybe what that pilot was. But mind you, I haven't watched a whole lot of old TV lately because mm-hmm. I don't hate myself that much. Well, and again, remember, this was kind of an era of change in TV, too, where yeah, primetime soap operas had been a thing. You know, you had Dynasty and Dallas mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But you have to remember how much Twin Peaks changed things mm-hmm. in terms of the way the TV became serialized. And I think 90210 and Beverly Hills were definitely like the start of the next era of that type of storytelling. I think this is definitely even probably doing the shorter block of episodes where we'll have the same creative team doing all of them, not have to break up the story quite as much, is probably an experiment in that. And again, I think the time wasn't quite right for it. Again, in in streaming now, that's become the go-to norm. But again, we're talking about like 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see kind of an early experiment in a similar format to that. And again, we'll see how that plays out over, you know, an additional five episodes. Yep. We're not going to say goodnight yet because we'll be back. We're going to go and (laughs) take a little break and then we'll be back to record our discussion of episodes two through six. Yes. Of 2000, Malibu Road. (laughs) Sweaty sacks. giving it so much more Sweaty sacks, dark lighting. (laughs) Drifting. (laughs) Wide shot, medium shot, close up. Oh my Mm. God, I want that to be the lyrics. (laughs) That's the lyrics of the song now. Suddenly he has no shirt. That's what I love is the wide shot, he's wearing the skin suit. The medium shot, he's taking it off. And the close-up, he's got it off. (laughs) It's like, you are not repeating the same three motions, sir. Mm -mm. Don't stop. It's been a month and we are back covering the remainder of 2000 Malibu Road. This is still Noel and I'm still being joined by Angie and Evie. Yep, we're here. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So we covered the pilot episode of 2000 Malibu Road on the last discussion. And now we have episodes two through six, the remainder of the series. I don't really have much to add in terms of production notes. So Angie, do you want to just go ahead and roll with the synopsis? All right. Jade is arrested for the murder of the woman found dead on the beach. She initially hires Perry as her lawyer, but ends up firing her when it becomes clear Perry doesn't actually trust she's telling the truth. She hires Hal, the guy who tried to drown her, instead. Her wealthy mother and stepfather show up and bail her out. They offer to help her, but it comes with conditions. Her stepfather is running for office, and they want her to come back to Virginia and marry a man and have kids so that there's no more scandals present in the family. She doesn't want to do that, and after Hal tells her that the police have planted evidence that makes it look really bad for her, she begs him to get a fake passport so she can leave the country. Perry discovers that Hal isn't really a lawyer, and he almost kills Jade, but apparently chickens out at the last minute. Instead, the other guy from the first episode shows up to finish the job, but she's saved at the last moment by Joe, a good guy cop. She ends up eventually agreeing to go on a date with him. There's also some hints that her stepfather abused her as a child, and that's why she ran away at 14 and became a prostitute. Beyond semi-helping Jade, Perry continues to date Roger, the probable rapist, though he has a bad habit of just disappearing for a while with no explanation. She's a little afraid to jump into another relationship because she's not over the death of her fiancé, but that doesn't stop her from sleeping with him. She's able to clear him of charges at the preliminary hearing by messing with the poor girl who is accusing him and getting her to lose control on the witness stand. The girl then proceeds to stalk the two of them, writing on Perry's car and Roger's wall menacing messages, and even sends Perry a threatening fax. Or at least we think it's her, but the police can't find any solid proof. We do find out the reason for Roger's disappearing act, though, and it's because he has a split personality, and that other personality is, of course, evil. Perry's all set to leave with him on a romantic getaway, but instead evil Roger appears and is very obviously about to rape her as the credits roll in the last episode. Speaking of evil, Joy is basically nothing but constantly manipulating everyone, butting into their business, using voodoo and other forms of magic to mess with people to get what she wants. Honey, money. She blackmails. <laughs> 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 uh. 
She blackmails Scott to convince him to come with her to the studio to dig up a bunch of dirt on his boss so they can put him back in a position of power and get Lindsay another job. There's a show where an aging actress named Jessica is supposed to play against a homely daughter, but Joy forces Lindsay in there and wants the show to be all about her character instead, and she manipulates Jessica by taking advantage of her alcoholism. And when Scott won't sleep with her through all of this, she makes him impotent through magic. And poor Lindsay is fired and rehired so many times I can't even keep track. Eventually, a woman at a psychic shop warns Joy that all of the dark magic she's doing will come back at her, and in episode six, she is struck by lightning. Beyond all the push and pull Joy puts her through, Lindsay is also seeing Eric. They both bond over their desire to tell meaningful stories in Hollywood. Eric has a script all about the plight of the homeless, and he really wants Lindsay to star in it. They slowly fall in love, all the while having to hide everything from Joy, who tells Lindsay that all men are evil and only want one thing. Lindsay also goes to Jade to ask her about safe sex, and it basically becomes a public service announcement about using condoms because this is the early 90s. Lindsay was planning to have safe sex with Eric, but Joy's lightning strike puts delay on that. And we never know how any of this resolves. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> so, Angie. Yeah. Do you recommend the remainder of 2000 Malibu Road, and do you feel it justified the pilot episode? No, 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 a thousand times no. No, I didn't like it. Why did I have to watch this? <laughs> why, Joel Schumacher, why? <laughs> <sighs> Evie, same question. What Angie said, but louder. <laughs> Much louder, basically. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I will say there are actually at least two story threads I legitimately enjoyed in this remaining <laughs> stretch of episodes. Two threads that I thought if you pulled them out of the rest of the mess and gave them their own show, yeah, I would actually probably stick around and watch that show. Unfortunately, it's like, again, the majority of this is just really shitty writing. Yeah. It's poorly structured. <laughs> the dialogue is tacky. It's just clumsy and messy, and it's very bad writing. Mm -hmm. And Joel doesn't save it. Nope. Nope. So, no, I don't. I don't want to tune back in on the last image of Jennifer Beals being raped in a stairwell. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, that's the last scene? Like, okay. Why didn't anyone want to renew this? I don't understand. Yeah. There is a lot of complexity to that, but <sighs> let's just go ahead, since we're on that track, let's go ahead and talk about Roger. So... <laughs> Split personality or evil twin? It's got to be split personality because he disappears for a while. Yeah. See, I think nowadays it would just be like dissociative identity disorder. Yeah. Well, yeah. But that's not how that works anyway. No. Those words are too complex for the script. Right. Yeah. No. That's why I said split personality because this isn't doing a proper dissociative. No, it's not. It's just junk television. Yeah. He's secretly someone else. Ugh. Yeah, it's exactly what they're doing. Well, the thing that I noticed is we only see him in the evil persona twice and in both those he has brown hair. And you know he has the bleach blonde surfer look for the majority of his screen time. Well, I just figured he like was slicking it back or something. Like, you know, sometimes when you put a lot of gel in hair, yeah. it becomes darker. But I mean, it was down in his face in the last scene. To be fair, I'm not giving this any credit for cleverness. I'm just trying to figure out, are they trying to make you think it's split personality, but in reality it's evil twin? I think it's the show's trying to be clever and it's not. That's a common thread. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, I remember that was one of the things that we talked about in the first one. Where we were kind of doing some predictions for the remaining episodes. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be the ex-girlfriend on the stand was going to be the one who would reveal that, oh yeah, he actually is probably a rapist. But instead, they just like mm -hmm. dismantle her. Yeah. And then presumably his evil self does all these stalking gimmicks. Could be. And then it's mm -hmm. not that he's a rapist with a false front. He has a literal split personality. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> This is such soap opera season 17. Mm hmm So bad. It doesn't help that Michael T. Weiss is not a very good actor. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's really no. not. No. Well, when he's playing the nice guy, it's not so bad. But when he's supposed to be the evil guy, I'm like, oh, honey, no. Yeah. He's bringing up the cheese, I suppose, but not yeah. in a good way. Mm. And it's like, this is the guy that they thought should be the pretender who can slip into all these various identities. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, Evie, what did you think of at least of Jennifer Beals? I was so confused sometimes. <laughs> Honestly, that could just be like the entire tagline for like 2000 Malibu Road. I was so confused sometimes. That's in the TV guide. Yeah. 2000 Malibu Road. You'll be confused sometimes. <laughs> we find out about her fiance. 
But then she's shit talking cops a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then like she's supposed to be like the slush, but she's not really like you see her with what's supposed to be, I guess, a glass of wine or something. Mm-hmm. And the one comment about that guy about drinking a cup of coffee before she drove, which I'm like, that's not how that works. But sure. Yeah. But she's not really acting like a drunk unless she's supposed mm-hmm. to be a high functioning drunk. Just because she's holding a glass of wine all the time doesn't make her drunk. She's not even remotely trying to act drunk. And then the other thing, I don't know if she had trouble with the dialogue, which is certainly possible, but sometimes it was like she was just sort of going down her lines all like this really as fast as she possibly could. She was spitting everything out. She was not even really acting. Like her scenes with Joy especially were really painful to watch. Well, yeah, and that's just because they keep forcing I mean, Joy painful. into every single scene. Right, right. I want to say Joy gets more screen time in this show than anyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think Jennifer Beale still gives it her all. Mm -hmm. She's not a terrible actress, but again, it's a terrible script. A lot of these scenes are so archly written. I didn't mind how they played the alcohol consumption because, yes, there is a functional quality to it. And it's something that doesn't call attention to itself until other people call attention to it. And I kind of like playing it that subtly because that's something that you can then build into more of a problem in later episodes. And this is just kind of sowing the seeds for that. Yeah, maybe that was the intention. I think if the rest of her character were much better, we would let this go. Yeah. Yeah. I do still think it's interesting how there's the whole her and Jade getting the whole, you're my lawyer, now I fire you. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to move? No. God, it's like there's so many, do we have to move now in like every single episode? (laughs) God. Right. That's the entire premise of the show, that you all live together in this place. (laughs) Exactly. Yep. I don't blame Jennifer Beals for it. It's just, it's a bad part. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad that the friend who was in the law department, who was the woman in Flatliners, Mm -hmm. I thought that was a fellow lawyer. No, she's just the stenographer. That's what she said, because she's thinking about going into law and she talks her out of it. But you know, it would have been perfect to bring her back when she went to her old apartment to Mm. get her stuff. Mm -hmm. And instead we have that weird random neighbor that's like, oh, I thought somebody was breaking in. Yeah, just comes in in his bath towel and a baseball bat. (laughs) Yeah. All right, you have a good night. Don't leave your door open. (laughs) Just bizarre. You know, all that we had known in the first episode was that her fiancé was gone. We didn't really know Mm -hmm. why. And I know I floated the theory, well, maybe he was killed by someone that she had, like, failed to defend. Mm -hmm. And no, it's just he's a cop who was killed on the force. Mm -hmm. Technically, he was a detective who was killed. That's not the same as a beat cop. Right. What's interesting is also in the first episode, we didn't know who the brooding motorcycle guy was in the opening credits. Mm -hmm. It turns out to be a fellow cop who knew her husband, who then is going to build a relationship with kind of both her and Jade. So I think there was probably going to be a triangle Mm -hmm. that they were going to play out on that. Maybe so. So what did you think about Broody Motorcycle Cop? Much handsome. Much (laughs) handsome. Such wow. (laughs) He was really hard to read. I don't know if they were trying to like hide some dirt that we were going to find out about later or if maybe he didn't know what was going on with his character so he didn't know how to act sometimes. Also, the scene where he comes in and saves Jade's life, it looked like he fell off his motorcycle. It did not look like he was saving her. Joel was trying something cool there and it didn't work. (laughs) Nope. No, it did not. And then we get the whole thing where he shoots the guy and the guy just goes flying through the glass and the sparks and the neon sign. Uh It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I still can't figure out exactly, is he a beat cop? Is he a detective? Because then if he is, why was he also working as a prison guard? Yeah, he's everywhere. Cops don't just rotate around like that. Didn't you say Terry Louise Fisher had experience with law? She was a lawyer. So she should know how cops work. I'm guessing that she got into entertainment because she wasn't a very good lawyer. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe, but she's not a very good writer either. (laughs) That's pure speculation. That's not libel. Oh my God. She's not a good anything. No, that's not true. I'm sure she's a lovely person. Oh, we're going to get such a cease and desist put on this podcast. (laughs) I'm sure she's a lovely person. (laughs) (laughs) I think he's a potentially interesting character because he is going to have that triangle relationship with both women. But we Mm. never get a chance to develop it. Mm. Right. He's literally just lurking around, noticing things. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, his big motorcycle action scene (laughs) where it's like he skids in with the motorcycle and then has to hide behind a table. (laughs) If you're skidding down the motorcycle, you're using that as your shield. 
or you're using that to hit the bad guy. Right. And he does neither. It was so awkwardly shot. I'm sorry. It was so weird. Joel, you failed. <laughs> well, and even just touching on Joel's direction, he's still doing a lot of handheld wide angle lens mm-hmm. like he did in Flatliners. There is a lot of neon lighting, a lot of neon purples and pinks and stuff. Yeah. Again, we're watching it in not a very good format where it's kind of fuzzy and blurry and the colors are washed out. So we're not getting the full impact of all that. True. I think he does a very clean job with the direction. It never feels choppy or anything but there's nothing particularly interesting or engaging about a lot of it right the few times he does something interesting like even before the motorcycle slide you did have the camera panning through the parking the lot motel. of the motel and yeah. you see the shadow of the hitman walking across the wall mm-hmm. i thought that was a nice moment as crappy of a plot twist as it was jennifer beals at the base of the stairwell and you see the figure lit in the pink neon and the lightning and thunder coming down the stairs towards her it was a nice shot yeah there are some nicely composed bits but there's nothing really in how the scenes are built that really says much about joel's direction no no this could have been directed by almost anybody for most of it this could have literally been directed by my cat and my cat would have been like (laughs) the meow And people would have been like, brilliant. (laughs) By the way, I saw the cinematographer for all six episodes was the guy who did Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. Hmm. Okay. He did a few other horror movies in the 80s, but from the 90s on was largely just in TV. And to this day, he still does like CSI and NCIS and stuff like that. Okay. God, where to go from here? I'm trying to save joy for last. (laughs) Can I bring up just one thing? Does it involve honeys or bunnies? Neither. Okay. The editor, I'm guessing there probably just wasn't coverage for stuff, but how dare you, sir and or madam? It was just so bad. Like when Lindsay says to the Richard Grieco looking guy, oh, you know, Joy is going to take me for dinner because, you know, we fought. And then cut to they don't go for dinner. I'm like, just show me that. Or Lindsay's (laughs) coming in for her audition for the pilot for that show. Cut to we don't see the audition. Yeah, but that's type of the stuff that was in the script for the pilot, too. So I talked about the writing. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's frustrating me because I want to see this thing that you're talking about, which I know it's not the editor's fault, but I need to blame someone. (laughs) Half of this was edited by a woman and half of this was edited by a man, both of whom came out of porn in the 70s. (laughs) Yeah, the woman actually edited Hots, one of the jock topless women comedies of the early 80s. (laughs) And then the guy actually worked with Joel on a couple of other films afterwards. Again, that's something I even chalked down to the script level, because even reading that pilot script, the geography of the storytelling is all over the place. Yeah. Nobody really sat down with a whiteboard and post-it notes and actually mapped this shit out. That's what it feels (laughs) like. These all feel like first drafts. Yeah. The way that they talk about it, I'm like, okay, has it been weeks or has it been days? Yes. Because the Mm. implication that I get sometimes, and it's been a lot longer than we think it is, and other times they're like, oh yeah, blah, 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 two days. And I'm like, wait, what? Right. And I'm (laughs) sure we had scenes that were set during night even before then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was just a lot of bad pre-planning. This is something that I brought up with Angie off the record where Joel has talked about how even in the early 90s, he did have another drug problem where he... He would heavily hit drugs and alcohol between shoots where like a week before he would have to shoot something, he would clean up, sober up and be clean for the entire shoot. And then as soon as that was done, would hit the drugs, would hit the party scene and would just keep doing that until he has to do his next shoot. You know, we saw this with Dying Young, and I wouldn't be surprised mm-hmm. if we see this with some of those other ones, where it just feels like they didn't put the effort into the pre-production and the development of the material. Yeah. This, again, it feels like complete rough drafts. It doesn't feel like anyone really sat down with these scripts, cleaned them up, worked out the beats, worked out the geography of everything. So by the time he cleaned up and came to set, and again, this is pure speculation on my part, it's like Mm -hmm. they were already kind of locked with what they had. Mm -hmm. All of the Mm -hmm. location scouting would have already been booked by then, whether it's going to be shoot during the day or during the night would have already been booked by then. And so I think there was not the planning and pre-production put into this that there should have been. Yeah. And again, I'm not going to completely throw that all on Joel, but that's just something that I would not be surprised if that was a contributing factor because Joel can write better than this. Joel oh, has yeah. written better scripts than this. Yeah. Even I had problems with Samuel's Fire. Samuel's Fire was a better script than anything we have here. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I don't know that Joel would... I mean, maybe this will explain why the Batman movies had <laughs> scripts that they did. <laughs> Joel has better instincts as a writer than what we see here. So I don't know why we still ended up with scripts that were as poor of quality as they are with what they shot. Yeah. That just confuses me. Let's talk about Jade. So, Evie, what did you think about Jade's whole plot in this? I was so confused. (laughs) That is, this the whole show. I'm just... Lindsay was the only one I wasn't confused about. I will say that much. She barely has a plot. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) 
So what did you think about the whole parents and the politics and all that stuff? It was really nice out here in left field. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, she ran away and she became a child sex worker, which I'm like, that's a choice that you made show. Okay. And then all of a sudden, no, she came from this rich family and she ran away. And I'm like, there is an implication of, I think he's supposed to be your stepdad. So it's just a rape. It's not incest rape. But the implication is rape. Yeah. Right. This show is making choices that I'm like, maybe back then were fine. But nowadays, I'm just like, oh, my God, what is wrong with you? Again, exploring characters who come from past of sexual assault is, I don't think, inherently bad. It's all about how you do it. It's just that it's done in such a sloppy way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's going to take the deal. She's not going to take the deal. She's going to yeah. go back and marry the guy. She's not going to like, oh my God. Even that it's her parents are then trying to force her into a loveless marriage where she is expected to bear this man's children. Right. That she can uh, never get a divorce from. Which like, yes, she can. It gets really dark. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not even in a way that is captivatingly dark. Like, again, there's ways you can do something like that that's really fucking twisted and still do an interest and compelling and intelligent story out of it this is not one of those cases no the mom is so stereotypically southern bell that she literally oh. pulls out a fan and fans herself yes at the end of a scene <laughs> And then Mitchell Ryan, who plays the father, he has played this role in basically every single soap opera made since the 60s. He was part of the original cast of Dark Shadows. Mm. He is one of the soap opera mainstays. He'll just jump from soap to soap and he's always playing this guy. (laughs) And he'll usually get fired because he was a terrible alcoholic. And then he'll just jump to another soap and still play that guy. I just get so aggravated with her story because, and I guess we were going somewhere with it where the cop brings her the tape of Hal Mm -hmm. and somebody talking, but it's like, do they want to kill her? Do they want money from her? Is it all a scheme because they're also trying to like maybe ruin her parents and his shots at running for office? What is going on with those people? I know. I still can't tell if the fake lawyer and the hitman are working for the parents or against the parents. Right. Right. And, like, the whole thing with Hal, like, okay, he's going to shoot her, he can't do it, because I'm assuming they were probably going to say he was actually in love with her or whatever. Yeah, that's what I got. But the whole thing is they start making out on the bed, the gun falls, and I'm thinking, oh, she's going to find the gun and she's going to confront him. No, we just cut to a scene where he's just gone. Yeah. And then he never comes back. Right. Yeah. It was interesting, the twist where so much of this is built around him being her lawyer and presenting Mm -hmm. her with this evidence that they've found and setting up all these things in motion. And then Jennifer Beals and the cop look into it and find out there is no lawyer by that name. Mm -hmm. And then they even go to the offices and they're all cleaned out. That is an interesting twist I didn't see coming. Yeah. Unfortunately, again, he's not a very compelling actor. He's not a very compelling character. I still have no Mm -hmm. idea what actual part he was playing in things yeah i still don't know why they even killed the other woman and then set her up for that right if they were trying to lure the family in and then use her to embarrass the family i don't know or if it's the family trying to use that as a way to get her i still have no idea what the motive is there yeah that was again speculation that we flouted on that first episode was that he was potentially a politician and her being a prostitute was going to create drama Instead, we find out it's her family is and this whole other swath of storyline comes in. Yeah. It drowns in itself. Well, and the parents just kind of give up and they're not going to help her with her case, but she's not worried about her case anymore. Like nothing made sense anymore by the end of the sixth episode. Yeah. But was that because they realized they couldn't control her and then put out the hit on her? Maybe. It just doesn't all add up. No, it doesn't. Yeah. They're just like, oh yeah, we're leaving. And she's like, yeah, I'm not marrying what's his face. And the dad's just like, oh, okay then. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And didn't they mention something about a stepbrother somewhere in there that they don't talk about? Season two. <laughs> ah, okay. You know, you're right. When you're right, you're right. Probably. Unless they were going to set it up that she was right by her stepbrother. I don't know. Oh, God. Mm. Or both at the same time. Oh, God. Uh, Are you just uh, making it worse? Stop. <laughs> yeah. No, that would be the season three reveal. It's just trash. Again, it's just trash. Yeah. Again, it's like, you can make this story work. It's just so sloppily done, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's been my biggest issue with this entire series, is it's just so sloppily written. It's not structured well. The actual scenes don't play out well. The dialogue exchanges are nonsensical at times. Mm -hmm. It's hard to follow. It's bad writing. Yep. 
So speaking of joy, <sighs> remember how I said there were actually two threads that I legitimately enjoyed? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Shockingly, one of them was Joy's. What part? I actually really like the dark comedy of a cutthroat amateur agent teaming up and forging this bizarre twisted relationship with a perverted TV executive. I actually liked their scenes together, her and Scott. They were wrong, <sighs> but they were absurdly yeah. wrong. The one where they were breaking into the thing for the documents kind of worked, but most of the rest of it did not work at all for me. It didn't work for me, but I will say that I get where you're coming from with regards to just how ridiculous their scenes were and just how over the top Joy was that it was almost like an Alexander Payne dark comedy kind of thing. (laughs) See, and what I liked about Joy in those scenes was she was no longer wearing the mask. The mask was always so annoying, the whole honey bunny, Mm. false modesty type thing. Oh, God. Mm. Every time she said honey bunny, I was just like, the next time she says that, I'm going to stab her in the eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm literally going to put her into a bunny outfit and drown her in honey. (laughs) But I like that with him, she didn't put on the veneer. She was just the open, awful person. And he was an awful person. And they were just doing awful things to each other while also kind of oddly building this relationship with each other. I was just invested in wanting to see where they would go next. <laughs> Especially when she then suddenly uses voodoo magic to make his penis stop working. It was so <sighs> nice in left field all of a sudden. I know. That yeah. was one of those things where it was such an absurd plot that I was actually willing to go with that absurd twist. Mm-mm-mm. Mm so bad. I'm not saying it's good, but I wanted to see where that story was going to keep going. I just love that he walks up to her and he's like, you put a hex on me. I know. I went to the doctor. <laughs> like the doctor told you someone put a hex on you? They did a test. Like which doctor was like, oh yeah, someone voodooed your penis. <laughs> like what doctor is it? I want that story. <laughs> yeah. I want to know who the voodoo penis doctor is. <laughs> Oh, I've seen this before. And that should be like a 90s syndicated show. Voodoo Penis Doctor, MD. (laughs) God. I mean, it would have been a hit. (laughs) I would have watched that pilot in four episodes before I got canceled. (laughs) Mm -mm -mm. It's not that it's good. That's where it feels like they're rolling with how awful this is. Yeah. It's almost becoming funny. It's Mm -hmm. still not like hilarious, but at least it's kind of becoming funny. It held my attention. (laughs) Every other scene and thread that involved Joy, I couldn't stand. She just drowns every scene in forcing herself to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And yet with those scenes, whenever she was with Scott, what happened was he was the only character who seemed to be aware of how awful she was. I think that was another part of it, was that we Mm -hmm. got to see a character who's fully aware of what she's doing and is reacting to it and is suffering through it and also throwing stuff back at her in retaliation. And everyone else is still acting like, oh, well, she seems nice. Yeah, I don't understand why she had to have like a heart to heart with literally every other female character. Just to get gas about them. Well, just to remind them that men are awful. I'm like, is she going to be revealed to be a lesbian eventually? Because that seems about where the show might go. I don't know. She seemed interested in Scott. She was. You know what I mean? It was like the way she kept trying to be so chummy with them and remind them that men are evil seemed like they were going for that kind of ridiculousness. Oh, yeah. I think they were going with the old thread of because she's quote unquote quote, unattractive. She's never been able to lure men the way that all the other pretty characters are. Which is fucking stupid because she's adorable. Right. And she even makes lines about it, about how it's like, oh, I didn't know pretty women did this too. Mm -hmm. (sighs) When Jennifer Beals like waiting by the phone and stuff. Every time like Jade's mom called her fat or what, I was just so aggravated. Like, come on, (laughs) y'all. Yeah. This is ridiculous. And again, it's like Tuesday night looks like Drew Barrymore. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, she is technically wearing a quote unquote fat. She was literally wearing a pregnancy suit. So that's why she's very wide right around the middle. Oh, that's why I was like, why does she look pregnant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's why she has the extra weight in the specific areas. And then the very, you know, flouncy clothes to add to it. Yeah. That is kind of stupid, too, just because, no, there are just girls who like wearing... I'm like, now it's a whole fashion thing to wear, like, big, flouncy, stupid whatevers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (sighs) You know, I don't think it's your looks or what's chasing people away. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, I'm glad at least Lindsay does start to catch on to it toward the end because she clearly ruined this poor girl's life already. Yeah. She's obviously the one that broke off the thing with the fiance in their hometown or whatever. Yeah. And ugh. I'm surprised at the whole 
by the way, your sister told us about your parents. That's why we let you go from the film never came up. Right? Like, that's so obvious. That's true. And then the whole cliffhanger that they leave Joy on is she gets knocked out by the door in the storm. Oh, no. No, she was struck by lightning. There was like a spark. I didn't really because I'm like the way that they played it, at least the way I saw it was the wind blew too hard and it blew her over. I never saw the spark. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone at VFX has failed us. Yes. (laughs) Oh, they should have milked that. They should have like done like a full the lightning. I wonder if she's going to end up like she's changed (laughs) once she wakes up. She's a good person now or something. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I guarantee you. They're already doing it with Roger, so why not? Oh, God. <laughs> or she starts faking that she has amnesia and needs help being taken care of and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And therefore making Lindsay have to drop out of that movie with Richard Grieco lookalike. Ooh. Probably. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Or now she's awoken the craft. <laughs> Ooh, that would be awesome. I would love that. Or she's quickened. One or the other. Maybe she can shoot lightning from her fingers. Who knows? (gasps) Or all the things. Just all of them. All of them. Well, she already is basically a Sith Lord, so. (laughs) She is already the Kylo Ren of the series. Yeah. God, imagine Uh. her and Kylo Ren in an angry internet relationship. (laughs) That just won't end. Mm -mm -mm. They just become, like, bitterly codependent on each other. (laughs) So then let's go to Lindsay's story. And again, the second plot that I actually genuinely enjoyed and was kind of interesting where I go was the Lindsay and Eric relationship. I will give you that. Yeah, that one was interesting. Because it didn't feel soapy. It felt kind of refreshingly laid back. It was just Mm -hmm. a kind of nice relationship. Mm -hmm. They're both interested in each other. It kind of has its starts and its stops before they settle in. They're both struggling with their careers and where they want to go. You know, she's trying to get the acting rolling. He's trying to get his filmmaking rolling. And they converge both on a personal Mm -hmm. level and on a professional, hey, this is a project we both really believe and want to be a part of level. Right. I would like to see a story of just that, of just, you know, this actress struggling to make her break, this filmmaker who's struggling to make a break, and they run into each other and starts and stops and gradually grows into this thing. That's kind of nice and touching. And I kind of want that to just be separated from all the soap operas or direct that it keeps getting pulled into. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you could find a better obstacle for them, then my sister's a bitch who doesn't want me to see you. Yeah. Then yeah, you could have a good story there. And even stuff like when they're going to talk to the homeless kids. It's a good moment. Mm-hmm. It's better than the later PSA we get about the, the safe sex. <laughs> oh, God, that was just like, wow. Someone made a choice yeah. there and it was amazing. She walks up to the prostitute and says, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for sex yet. And the prostitute tells her all about safe sex and protection. And it should have had like mm-hmm. this 90s PSA yeah. logo scrolling across the bottom. Right. Yeah. And I can certainly understand why Joel would be very aware of that and would oh, want to yeah. highlight it. But it just comes out of nowhere and just does not fit at all. I mean, especially because you remember in Dying Young, we mentioned that he was coming off of a friend who was dying of right. AIDS. And, you know, right. I can understand wanting to yeah. include that message, but it was so heavy handed. Yes. So heavy handed. But it's like, again, I'm surprised at that whole, well, why did you let me go from the movie? Well, I didn't want to bring it up, but your sister told me about your mother. (laughs) She could be like, my mother's still alive in (laughs) Reseda. Right, right. There needed to be more of a Lindsay openly, finally confronting the fact that Joy is lying and manipulating everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even the whole Sally Kellerman. (laughs) Oh, God, yeah. As the actress for the show that they were trying to get set up. And again, every (sighs) single time Joy is a part of one of those scenes, Mm -hmm. it's like, hey, we're so thankful we get to the script with you by the way here's revisions that make my sister have a bigger role and Lindsay's like what yeah or the whole pretending to be an alcoholic so she can take this woman to aa yes. meetings oh my god that so was bad. horrifying and that she was trying to push the woman to get back into drinking mm-hmm. and then that sally kellerman's joke on that is that every time she feels like drinking she just binge eats other things yeah What I liked about the scenes with Scott was it was finally a character who was openly acknowledging how awful Joy was. (laughs) So I think that's why I got into it. I think the best part was it's him and Lindsay on the beach and Joy's just like, Lindsay, he's like, ugh. And I'm like, I feel that on a (laughs) spiritual level. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, it's a Joel Schumacher show when they break into a place and instead of using flashlights, they have neon green glow sticks. Oh, yeah, I know, the glow sticks to see. I was like, wait, is he really? Is that what I think it is? Wow, okay. And it's like, you know what would have prevented the guard from stumbling across you? If you shut the door after you went in. (laughs) Anything else you can think of that you want to bring up on this one? Oh, God. 
Is there anything else that really aggravated me? <laughs> I mean, I'm glad at least almost none of our predictions came true, just not in good ways. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm also glad that it wasn't Joy pressuring Lindsay to get into a relationship with Scott in order to further her career. It was instead Joy forcing him into a relationship, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, by the way, I found out the costume designer for this was actually Madonna's costume designer who did Material Girl and Vogue and a bunch of stuff. And like since then has become one of the top costume designers in Hollywood and does like Pirates of the Caribbean and Oblivion and stuff like that. Madonna's costume designer explains Lindsay's outfits for most of (laughs) them. Right? Like, she's going in to meet people for the first time, and I'm like, why would you wear that? Yeah. Well, this was also that era of Drew Barrymore where she was, like, flashing David Letterman on his show and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is definitely before her comeback and coming back strong. This was the bad girl's doppelganger Mm -hmm. era. Literally, she did doppelganger right after this movie. Any final thoughts that you can think of, Evie, on the show as a whole? (sighs) I'm so confused. (laughs) That was me during the whole show was like I was confused or there were times where I like spaced out because I just got bored and I was like, wait, what? I had to go back and rewatch it. I'm guessing your thoughts is just a gif of that motorcycle slide, right? (laughs) Oh, God, yeah. (laughs) Just on repeat. (laughs) This feels like it should be cool, but why? Yeah. No, my thoughts are actually that guy getting shot and it being like a cannon has hit him and he goes flying. Those are my thoughts. God, how come we never (laughs) had like Joel Schumacher do his attempt at a John Woo movie? <laughs> right? I feel like that would be amazing. Mm-hmm. He could pull off the doves, but I don't know about the action. Doesn't matter, does it? It'll be amazing anyway. There, Angie? I don't want to see more episodes of it, but I would really love like an interview or something where they could explain just what was going on with Jade. I have so many questions that I want answered, but I don't want to see any more of the show ever. <laughs> I have a few answers I can give you in a minute, but before we do, let me just wrap up how this show did in the ratings. Because again, we talked about the first two episodes debuted on a Sunday night Mm -hmm. on August 23rd, 1992, and did 16 million in ratings. So it did pretty well on its debut night. On its second night, it moved to its regular slot on Wednesday, August 26th where it did drop in the ratings, but down to 12.1 million. Hmm. And it was up against nothing. It was up against reruns of Home Improvement and Seinfeld. And it was up against Arresting Behavior, a cop sitcom that was canceled after five episodes. Okay. Okay. So, but not Hat Squad, that show that I heard the (laughs) advertisement for at the end of one of the episodes. Right. So it was still doing pretty well for its second night. And then the fourth episode was on Wednesday, September 2nd, 1992. Again, still reruns of Home Improvement, Seinfeld, Wings, another episode of Resting Behavior. I think this is the last episode. And this is the first time where it went head to head against Melrose Place. Mm -hmm. Now, Melrose Place debuted that same year. It was another Aaron Spelling production. So I think there was some frustration on his part that he had shows on two different networks that were being aired opposite each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was the eighth episode of Melrose Place. It had just moved to Wednesday. 2000 Malibu Road still beat it in the ratings. Hmm. Melrose Place only did 8.7. Malibu Road did 10.4. However, the reruns of Home Improvement, Seinfeld, and Wings still did better. Wow. (laughs) So then going to the final night, they actually aired episodes five and six together on the following Wednesday, September 9th, 1992. Mm -hmm. Again, reruns of Home Improvement, Seinfeld. Arresting Development was canceled, so they threw in a repeat of Roseanne. (laughs) And again, it was up against Melrose Place. And again, it still beat Melrose Place. Damn. (laughs) How? However, by this point, its ratings had already dropped to 9.8 million, which are still good ratings by today's standards, but back then they still wanted somewhere between 10 to 12. Okay. And I actually looked at Melrose Place. After the first season, Melrose Place's ratings actually started to pick up more because it was doing around 7, 8 million, and then it started to get around 9 to 10 million, and it pretty much sustained that 9 to 10 million until its last season. So I don't think the problem with 2000 Malibu Road was the ratings. I did find some interviews with Jennifer Beals with Tuesday Night, and I even found an interview with Joel where he briefly brought it up. Hmm. So the problem was is that the ratings did slide to the point where they were a little hesitant, but what really killed it was there were disagreements with the writer of the show. Yeah, no big shock there. (laughs) Yeah. And it was a more expensive show to produce because Jennifer Beals and Drew Barrymore were still working movie stars at the time and had larger salaries. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Beals, around this time, she was settling into a lot of direct-to-video and TV movie stuff. She wouldn't have another big film until 1997 with Devil in a Blue Dress. 
But Drew Barrymore, while she had become a little bit of a laughingstock in the industry, her film Poison Ivy was still a big hit. Doppelganger was a bomb, but again, like one year after this, she had Bad Girls, which was another big hit. Mm. And within just a couple years is when she had her big resurgence where she did Scream. And then immediately mm. after that, she did the Adam Sandler movies and Never Been Kissed. Mm -hmm. And she had her major comeback. So right. she was still someone who it would cost a bit to bring her back for another season. Mm -hmm. That all tied together with the fact that the ratings settled into a certain spot where that's ultimately why they decided not to move forward. Okay. I'm wondering also if the writer having some level of... Of producerial control also was preventing the scripts from being changed any more than they were. Could be. I noticed that there was one episode, only episode three, was co-written by another person. And that woman went on to Melrose Place and then eventually became a story editor and producer over there. And she was one of the people who took over Gilmore Girls for its last season. Okay. Ah! Uh -huh. Yeah. Kimberly Costello. She was also one of the major writers and producers on The Pretender and didn't really do a whole lot of other good stuff. Mm. She wasn't exactly helping. Right. No. But yeah, if there were disagreements with the writer, if this writer had already been like forcefully ejected from a previous show where problems <laughs> arose, the fact that this is pretty much her last work in the industry, mm -hmm. I think she did like one other pilot and then has been retired ever since. It was a show that just wasn't working behind the scenes and it reflects in the show itself. Yeah. So we'll be back next week with the uh, 2005 relaunch, 3000 Malibu Road. Mm, no. Mm -mm. Which was done by the people who <laughs> took over Dawson's Creek after Kevin Williams had left. Mm. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. 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 No. 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 Nope. No. Nope. That wraps up our 2000 Malibu Road episode. Nothing significant was lost or gained. I thought you said you had answers for me on what the heck they were trying to go with these stories. Oh, I didn't yeah. mean on the characters. I just meant on the behind the scenes stuff. Oh, oh. no. I just wanted to know what the hell they were trying to do with Jade. I have no idea. I know. I'll forget about it next week. Okay, I googled this because at some overseas ones, they had a voiceover thing from Jade. Mm. Oh, yeah. I can't find any video or anything of it. All I found was a post that was basically like, Lindsay went on to get famous. Joy ended up a teacher. What? Perry ended up going insane. What? And that's all. Like, I can't find any proof that this is actually true. That's all I found was like someone saying like, yeah, this is what happened. I mean, that would sound right for this show. Wait, who went insane? Perry. Really? The lawyer went insane. Yeah. So is there no evil version of Roger? That was a hallucination? Maybe the evil version of Roger raping her made her go insane like it made the other girl go insane. Mm. Did she catch his insanity like an STD? Maybe. <gasps> what if that's how that works? Because this show would be like, yeah, that's how insanity works. It's brain herpes. Wait, but no, I want to go back to Joy Became a Teacher. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I don't have any proof that this is actually true. This is from right. like a message board somewhere. I mean, I know that they did have something that they added at the end for the European release. I didn't find mm -hmm. anything on what. It was kind of like Twin Peaks. The pilot had like an ending that they added for the European release in case they just wanted to release that as a movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they at least cut the rape scene from happening? Because I could see some of that working if you just removed that. Like if you peeled off the cliffhangers mm -hmm. and you just had the end be the Jade plot being resolved with the hitman being taken down by the cop no i think it was literally after the last scene but again like i can't find any video yeah. proof of this this was me googling for the better part of two hours that's all i found it feels like that's less what their intention was and so much just something got tacked on by the producers mm -hmm. right right but a teacher joy a teacher. teacher yeah i mean there are some bad teachers out there but wow i mean i can see her becoming a network exec yeah yeah like I said, maybe the lightning strike changed her personality, and so she decided she wanted to help children. I don't know. God, I'm surprised the lightning didn't strike Scott, given all the metaphorical pins he had sticking out of him. Right? <laughs> and he gets like a super penis. That psychic shop was like straight out of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, too, by the I, way. I know. And then the show goes supernatural. <laughs> that was such a random yeah. place. For an erectile dysfunction joke. <laughs> Just, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So that wraps up 2000 Malibu Road. Yep. We shall never speak of it again. Good. Except when you make me do the recap decade episode. <laughs> One I gotta say is, you know, the 80s were such a consistently enjoyable period for Joel Schumacher and his films. And then mm -hmm. we've hit the 90s and we had Flatliners and then Dying mm -hmm. Young in 2000 Malibu Road are two of the worst things we've covered since Virginia Hill. Yeah, it's going to get better, though. It will. It will. I'm just worried about it starting to slide into inconsistency. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, we know there's reasons why it's going to be all over the place right. in a little bit. 
I feel bad saying that because I've come to really enjoy Joel Schumacher. But yeah, these two projects did not come together Mm -mm. at all. No, no, no. And our next one's going to be Falling Down, which I know neither of us have seen. Right. Fingers crossed for that one. I know it's got a good following, a good reputation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to finally seeing it and seeing what I think of it. Well, thank you again for joining us, Evie. Yes. I feel like you guys hate me, but... (laughs) It's fine. I deserve this. I deserve this. <laughs> we just hate your Skype. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S C H U M A C A S T dot blogspot.com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. <laughs>